government let these men down, let me down, let everybody down. Living, missing American POWs were left behind. They damn well were left behind. Now, suppose this had gotten out to the American people. Oh, we went back to get Jessica Lynch because America never leaves a man behind. The staff provided um, us a memo that thousands were left alive yes. in Korea after the war was over. And uh, the figure was that 8,000 were not returned. Do you believe there's sufficient evidence to make a finding that Americans were transferred from Korea to either China or the Soviet Union? Apparently, yes. Uh, it's time for you people to come up here and accept that evidence and begin to move to the next step which is to find out what happened to these people and where they are. It's a tremendous shame for any country to think that they left its, its people behind. My name is Bob Dumas. I'm from Canterbury, Connecticut. I was a Korean War veteran, two tours of duty in Korea. I had four brothers on the front line at one time. My youngest brother was captured on November 4th, 1950 at Andrew, northeast of Andrew, right up here on the map. We used to play in a tank, an old World War II tank in town. That was a monument. We used to come out of school every afternoon, Catholic school. We used to jump on the tank, make believe we were soldiers. I played along with him because that's what he wanted. And I think that's where he got the idea to be in the service, was uh, playing around in that tank. Uh, he was a real, real funny guy, real sociable person, uh, a likable guy, uh, always uh, doing some kind of pranks. He liked to do a lot of gestures with his hands, you know, like making a duck on a wall and things of that nature. He used to have a, a routine, uh, like with the song, Me and My Shadow. I remember that very distinctly. I remember many times when we were on a ship uh, heading to Korea, because we were scared, you know. June 25th, 1950, the North Korean communists attacked the Republic of Korea without warning or justification. One of history's most important questions faced the world. Would free nations under the flag of the United Nations band together to halt that aggression? The first year in Korea has provided the answer. With men and materiel, the free nations have proven that they will. Bob served two tours of duty in Korea hoping to find Roger. In 1953, Bob, along with his older brothers, Bill and Ted, who were also serving in Korea, returned home with no news about their youngest sibling. A year after the war ended, Roger and over 8,000 other American MIAs were declared missing, presumed dead. And she had called me over, and I was standing at the foot of the bed with my wife, and uh, she says, Keep looking for your brother because he's still alive. I still see him as being alive. So I made a promise to her then and there. I'd keep looking for, her, for him for the rest of my life. And that's exactly what I did. I kept that promise. For the next 25 years, Bob appealed to Pentagon and government officials for information about his brother. Finally, he received an answer from the Army. It was just a card they sent me. It said that his records were burnt in a fire in 1973. All records were burnt on Korean War, missing in action, which was a total lie I found out many years later. Bob's exhaustive investigation revealed that his brother Roger had in fact been a POW and was known to be alive when the war ended in 1953. The Pentagon vehemently denied that Roger was ever a POW. After thousands of meetings and phone conversations with government officials, Bob finally landed a meeting with President Reagan, arranged by Senator Strom Thurmond. 
Bob briefly met the president, but then spent the next 90 minutes in a contentious meeting with the National Security Advisor, Admiral James Bud Nance. He said, well, well, we don't want to start a war over this, you know. I said, I don't think by sitting down and negotiating with the North Koreans for live Americans from the Korean War that you're going to start a war over this. And I said, well, I guess my next step would be to go into federal court. And he said, you don't want to do that. He says, if you go into federal court, you're going to embarrass the president and the nation. I said, I don't think I'll embarrass anybody. Maybe we'll get to the truth of what happened to these men. The U.S. Army vigorously attempted to discredit Bob's lawsuit during a year of pretrial hearings. On July 19, 1983, Bob finally was given the chance to present his evidence that Roger was a prisoner of war. If successful, Bob was certain his unprecedented case would force the Army to investigate Roger's disappearance in North Korea. I'd have to go to federal court to prove he was a prisoner. They knew that I couldn't prove it in federal court because no one had ever gone through a court in this country, in the history of this country, to get a status change to prisoner of war for missing an action. There were various motions that the government was making to keep it from going to trial. We are in agreement that every effort to keep this matter out of the public eye should be made. It is clear from your memo that you wish no additional information provided to the Justice Department. It is also my understanding from a conversation with Major John T. Burton of the Litigation Division that the Army will not turn over documents that Dumas is seeking under a court order. Because of the nature of this case and the undesirable precedent that might occur, your course of action seems appropriate. Although too ill to travel, ex-POW George Rogers provided a deposition and identified Roger Dumas in POW camp photos that Bob had managed to obtain. The government uh, contested those pictures and said that they weren't uh, Roger Dumas at all, they were some, somebody else. And at the deposition, the U.S. attorney uh, dutifully opened the envelope uh, and for the first time exposed Rogers to these pictures. And the question was, could you pick out the individual whom you remember or recall seeing in Camp 5. And his finger went to Roger Dumas. It was a very uh, Im important turning point in the case because it, 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 it lended great credibility to, to Bob's uh, photographs. And uh, George Rogers called me one night, he said, Bob, he said, did you know that Freddie Hart, Fred Hart died, died of a heart attack? I said, it seems like all these guys are dying of heart attacks, George. He said, yeah, isn't that un unusual? He says, everybody's dying of a heart attack. He said, but I don't believe he died of a heart attack. I think something else is going on here. There was this sort of dark cloud you know, that would hang over our witnesses, uh, which was somewhat disconcerting. Lloyd Pate was the only ex-POW witness able to testify in court. While he was sequestered in a waiting room, he was confronted by a Pentagon officer who threatened to make public damaging information about his mother's past. I told him, I said, hey, bring it all out. She's dead. What harm can you do to her? And you sure as hell can't hurt me. And why wouldn't you want this to come out? I said, the truth never hurt anybody. That story, again, held, I think, the entire courtroom for probably the better part of an afternoon uh, in complete and utter, utter silence. I mean, you can hear the ticking of a clock. Over 50% of the men at Camp 5 died from starvation, exposure, uh, intestinal parasites, uh, disease, because there was no medical care there and very little food, no warmth, uh, so everything was against you. He would carry sick soldiers into a, a storage facility to die, essentially, uh, because they couldn't bury them in the wintertime. Once they died, they'd stack them up like cordwood. Uh, and he went into one of these, uh, what was then a, a lean-to, and uh, discovered uh, an individual who was lying there in, in unconscious. I had no idea at all that he would uh, 
survived because he had a chunk of flesh miss missing out of his side between his ribs and his hip bone, hip bone uh, larger than your fist. And uh, it had done turn black. And uh, everybody in stinking, everybody felt that he, he wasn't going to last. So I had nothing to lose. And he, uh, I had been told that he was uh, had been part of the 24th Division. So I went into a latrine bathroom, toilet, whatever you want to call it, and I scooped down in there and got some uh, maggots and packed them in there and covered it over with a cloth. And I forgot about him. And four or five months later, he met him on the Yellow River where they were bathing. And this soldier came up with a T-shirt on that they gave him with his name Dumas on it, D-U-M-A-S. And he says, uh, do you remember putting maggots in a man's sight? I sort of laughed. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm that man. Providing a deposition for the court, former POW Ciro Santo stated he was with Roger the day he was left behind. I didn't see him until Freedom Bridge. And that's when we saw a group of GIs being taken away from the Chinese. And Dumas was in that crowd. I said, well, he was in a camp with me. He was alive. He was re being repatriated. I mean, pfft. we came south. He went north. So several months later, I received a, a certificate from the Army, Secretary of the Army, John Marsh, where they changed the status to prisoner of war, but then they did presume them dead again. It was a slap in the face by saying, look, yeah, okay, we'll, find, we'll, we'll, we'll fi make the finding that he, he was a prisoner of war, but now consider the fact closed because there's a presumptive finding of death and there's no point in going any further. A 1954 Pentagon memo from the Assistant Secretary of the Army gives a chilling account of the decision to invoke the Missing Persons Act. It states, a further complicating factor in the situation is that to continue to carry these personnel in a missing status is costing over one million dollars annually. It may become necessary at some future date to drop them from our records as missing and presumed dead. And, and his point was, why did the U.S. government in 1954 declare all these guys dead? They just presumed them all dead. Um, and I think there's always been an undercurrent in this country that of, of we left these guys there. It's a, weird, it's a weird logic they have, okay? They'll keep somebody like Roger Dumas in the MIA status because if they make him a POW, that means he's, he's left behind. The North Korean communists were caught in a giant nutcracker formed by the UN forces in the North and the UN forces in the South. The closing of that nutcracker brought red resistance in the Republic of Korea virtually to an end. Seoul was liberated in fierce street-to-street -street fighting. This capital city, once with a population of a million five hundred thousand persons, had suffered terribly during its brief period under communist rule. It became the first national capital since World War II to be wrested from the hands of a red invader. And I was nobody but a brother of a prisoner who was uh, still left in North Korea. But he took enough confidence, he had enough confidence in me to know that I was dealing with the issue. And the issue was in federal court, which they understood in this country. So uh, what I did was I contacted the government and told them that I was talking to the North Korean ambassador. He wanted to talk about American POWs, but they did not want to talk to him. Mr. Dumas, you, you have done something that I have done uh, uh, on several occasions, which is to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one person with North Koreans rather than having going through the, the military armistice commander. Uh, but what, what is your reaction to the people that you have talked with in terms of their resolve here? Well, I've had 19 meetings with them in person, and I've had 250 phone calls, all tape recorded, if anybody wants to listen to them, with the ambassadors, and they allowed me to do this. They have never wavered from the issue of POWs and MIAs, and they've never asked for any money. They've never asked for anything but someone like you. You were the first man to walk into North Korea and the history of the North Korean government. 
a senator, a United States senator, and you talked with these people. So if you can talk with them, why can't the President of the United States talk with them? Or the Vice President of the United States? Or the Secretary of Defense? Or the Secretary of State? This is all he ever said all these years. One-on-one. -on -one. You know, you, you speak to them. You know how they are. They're you know, one-on-one. In 1987, when Jesse Jackson was running for president, Bob arranged a meeting between the Reverend and North Korean Ambassador Park gil Young. Reverend Jackson bluntly asked the ambassador about American POWs being held in North Korea. He said, I'm running for president of the United States. I would like to come to your country only on one condition. If there are any live Americans from the Korean War still in your country, I would like to come there and discuss that situation with your country on a humanitarian basis, nothing else, just a humanitarian basis. And it would be good for both our countries if we could discuss this issue in your country. And uh, Ambassador Park said, yes, it would be good for my country also. He said, I would agree to that. Despite his awareness of the government's attempt to stop Bob's investigation, Jackson called Secretary of State James Baker to inform him of their plan to visit North Korea. I told him in that room, think about it, Reverend. You just screwed up the whole meeting for us. Four days later, Jackson's Rainbow Coalition informed Bob that the Christmas Eve trip to North Korea to negotiate for live American POWs was canceled because the State Department levied travel sanctions on North Korea. Never heard another word. That was the end of it. discussion of procedure for exchange and repatriation of prisoners of war in Korea continues to be one of the main stumbling blocks in the peace negotiations at Panmunjom. Here is a batch of communist prisoners of war just captured by United Nations forces. It is completely evident that they are dirty and unkempt no matter how well armed they have been by their red masters. Many have been unwillingly conscripted into the communist hordes trying to overwhelm the Republic of Korea. In United Nations prisoner of war camps, they are rehabilitated and extended every possible comfort. Physical cleanliness and adequate supplies are provided for both North Korean and Chinese captives. Each prisoner is identified, and the camp itself is well marked, so marauding enemy planes make no mistake. This is apparently in sharp contrast to communist camps where we have been accused of bombing our own men. The International Red Cross has asked repeatedly for permission to inspect communist prisoner of war camps where United Nations soldiers are held until negotiations for release can be concluded. The Reds have refused neutral Red Cross representatives access to such camps. The United Nations offers each prisoner an opportunity to choose his own future. He would not be compelled to rejoin the Reds. This freedom the enemy refuses to sanction. For several years after the Korean War, the issue of abandoned POWs weighed heavily on the minds of government officials. First at the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr. addressed the General Assembly, demanding the release of POWs still being held by North Korea and China, and a full accounting of over 3,000 U.N. command POWs that were not repatriated after the war. Nearly four years later, House Resolution 292 was brought before Congress. It stated in part, It is the sense of the Congress that the President should make the return of the 450 American prisoners of war still imprisoned by Communist forces, the foremost objective of the foreign policy of the United States. On March 2, 1957, as the Senate was deliberating on the same issue, Senator John F. Kennedy stated that the repatriation of these abandoned POWs was our government's top priority. JFK's passion for this issue continued when he was president. On October 11, 1961, the president proclaimed ongoing negotiations for the release of the POWs. We have been meeting periodically for the last three or four years for a period at Geneva, and of course most recently at Warsaw, in which we talk about the question of the exchange of prisoners, or rather the release of prisoners, and other matters. With JFK's assassination, hopes of repatriating the abandoned Korean War POWs faded. 
28 years later, the U.S. Senate minority staff would investigate the persistent live sighting reports of American POWs in North Korea and hundreds more abandoned in Southeast Asia after the Vietnam War. The results of the investigation were contained in a report entitled An Examination of U.S. Policy Toward POW MIAs. The claims made by the minority report of abandoned POWs and subsequent government malfeasance sent shockwaves through the Senate. And what we found was that there was an overabundance of information that indicated there were people left behind and that there seemed to be a concerted effort on the part of the intelligence community and the administration, whichever administration was in a power at the time. And it, and it spanned both Democrats and Republicans. It was by no means a one-party issue. What, what, we sh what we showed was that in every instance where they could disclaim the information, there was an effort to do so without giving the benefit of the doubt. And we felt that the reason for that was simply because it was an embarrassment to the whole government. This report received a wide distribution among the official community in Washington and all the diplomatic and attaches around Washington. It was the most distributed report that the Senate has ever done. I understand it was, in, it was serialized in the Soviet Union. Through Dan Perrin's efforts, we got probably a million copies out there one way or another. While the Senate minority staff was investigating abandoned POWs, Colonel Millard Peck, the Pentagon's chief of the Special Office for POW MIAs, resigned with a parting volley of venomous criticism of the Defense Department's POW MIA investigation. Millard Peck was a, a Special Forces officer, highly decorated. I think he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross twice. And he actually volunteered for this position because he was so concerned about POWs and thought here was a, an honorable way to uh, uh, spend a couple years in the Pentagon. And see, they put a colonel in there mm -hmm. that decided he would end his career with a real honorable, intensive investigation to try and solve this. And he just ran into one stone wall after another. After two years, he was so disgusted with the manner in which the whole issue was being handled that he wrote about a five or a six page memorandum. The, the one catchphrase in his uh, letter of resignation, the tawdry illusion of progress. There's all this motion, people running around, they're sending investigators here, they're sending investigators here, but they don't know the right questions, they don't speak the language where they're going, uh, they have no inf uh, ability to enforce or to require answers and it's all the tawdry illusion of progress. And he took that memorandum and he took his dagger out of his sheath and stabbed it through the memorandum on the door of his office and walked out of the Pentagon and never returned. Well, the government was not happy with it. And of course they said it was not true, so we asked them to show us where it was wrong. One of the people, top people on the NSC was involved and paid a visit to Jesse Helms and basically said these people have got to go. Senator Helms appoints Nance his chief of staff. He goes back to Washington, fires that entire damn committee. He felt this needed to happen and that he thanked us for what we did, but this was, this was, we were being let go for the good of the country. And that was it. He said for national security reasons. Which is most interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I basically said, what is this f***ing guy saying? And it, to me it was a cop-out, it was a sell-out. National security is when you're protecting the United States. What they're doing is protecting individuals, and it doesn't have a damn thing to do with national security. Fires the, uh, Senator Helms, chief of staff of 26 years, fires him, and he is virtually running Senator Helms' office now. When he was in the White House, he closed down POW uh, uh, investigations, uh, especially the mission that was directed by Bo Gritz. Uh, so he had a, a, a vested interest in shutting down anything to do with POWs. And as a result of the report, the Senate felt compelled to set up the select committee, and uh, that it took them nine months to set up the committee, mainly because of the opposition of uh, uh, Senator McCain, who was bitterly opposed to any attempt to find the POWs, which is remarkable seeing that he was a POW himself. 
Senator McCain seemed to be one of the people that was an obstructionist who was not interested in the truth coming out, uh, who tried to attack people rather than learn what they had to say. In no instance would he ever, ever give in and say there were POWs left behind. And my first question is how would he know or not know? So just that which is reasonable he never exhibited, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's a guilt complex. Maybe he promised the Vietnamese something. Okay, and I don't know what it is. Uh, and maybe he actually believes that. That would be the saddest of all. I mean, he was yelling and screaming at me. It had me in tears. I mean, I just... I... Oh, to everybody. To me, repeat, he was very rude to me on several occasions. He probably did more harm to the idea of trying to get the truth out than any other single person through the efforts he did to block the release of classified intelligence dealing with the POWMIA problem. McCain stepped in and, in effect, made it harder to get documentation. That certainly hurt us because we had hoped for a massive release of documentation. Many, many documents that were held back for, for no reason, and our, our goal on the committee was to just dump this stuff, to, to declassify it, literally, to the public. Uh, but, of course, uh, you know, uh, they withheld information from the committee. Uh, the U.S. government held all kinds of information from the committee, withheld information from the committee. I know that for a fact. Uh, Even POWs, we knew who wanted to see their own, their own uh, debriefings, were not permitted because of the McCain uh, regulation. But where did McCain get compliments for doing this? The bureaucrats at the Pentagon because it put a workload on them. It put a workload on them for missing and action people. And did we need that bill to handle a Scott Spiker case? Oh, you bet we did. And also what it did, and this is what he really opposed, and if you remember the contentiousness we got into him in his office, was that it would hold the bureaucrats accountable by penalty of law That's if right. they lied or if they withheld information. That's right. And he fought tooth and nail to protect those bureaucrats. Yes. Because they were protecting him. I could never understand that. Why would we, uh, if someone was guilty of withholding information that would help us to solve the mystery of what happened to an MIA and did it deliberately, why would we not want to prosecute that person? Um, so I could never understand it. I thought the language was written. I, th I know Bob Dornan had a hand in it. I thought the language was written very well. Uh, I, I supported it, fought for it hard uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Senate and mostly on the Armed Services Committee where we debated it, but it was, it was watered down to basically where it was almost worthless. Now, one of the things that happened with that bill is that we were submarined. The House side, we passed it uh, with no, no, I don't believe anybody opposed it. Was it, it was a pretty much unanimous vote. 401 to 0 on the House, with every single Republican who is serving sponsoring it, and about a third of the Democrats. But on the Senate side, we had, we had one person standing in the way of getting in positions that would have been very tough on government bureaucrats who didn't tell the truth. And that one person was Senator John McCain. He didn't want nobody to check his background, because a lot of POWs that were with him in the camp said he was a, was a collaborator of the enemy. He gave the enemy the information they wanted. But we do know that when he was there, that he cooperated with communist news services in, in giving uh, uh, interviews that, uh, that were um, not flattering to the United States. Information shows that he made over 32 tapes of uh, propaganda for the Vietnamese government. Certainly you do what you need to do to stay alive. Nobody would fault anybody for that. But there comes a point in time where enough is enough. He made those transcriptions, and in the transcriptions, I heard a POW or heard them coming into his cell and said, oh my God, is that Admiral McCain's son? Is that the Admiral's son? Is that Johnny telling us that our principal targets are schools, orphanages, hospitals, temples, churches? That was Jane Fonda's line. Where are those transcriptions? Believe me, they're in the archives of the museum, the bragging military, phony military museum in Hanoi. McCain could not have one of those turn up in the middle of a presidential race. 
He knows that, I know that, and a few other people know that, and that's why he went against Bob Dole's legislation. And he didn't want nobody looking into his background in the camp, what went on in that camp. That stuff is still classified, so nobody can see it. And he just had it classified forever, so nobody will ever look at it. Uh, that he was given special treatment and he was put in a room with uh, two other defectors who were later uh, given special treatment. Uh, although I will say to his credit that he refused to be repatriated as a result. And it sounds so good at first. McCain was offered the chance to come home. They called him the prince. And he could have. But nobody ever takes that one step beyond that. If John Admiral John McCain II, Jr., if his son, a lieutenant senior grade, had accepted this princely status and come home in 1967 while the others would sit there for five years, what would the Navy have done with the son of an admiral who opted to get special treatment and come home? No Navy career, no House seat, no Senate seat would have been the end of his career. And they were offering him this chance to go home in one of the three groups that came home in 68. The slip, and McCain calls we're them. We're all collaborators. Yeah, and McCain called them this, except for Doug Hagel. The Slipperies, the Slimies, and the Sleazies. I heard, I once forgot one of those names, and he refreshed my memory. The Slipperies, the Slimies, and the Sleazies. So that meant that he would have become a Slimy, a Sleazy, and a Slippery, ruining his career, and the Admiral's son goes home. So what I'm saying is, Yes, he chose to stay, but did he have an alternative if he ever wanted to have a life? And what would it have done to his father? And his activities were sufficiently consistent and widespread in opposing efforts to learn the truth uh, that he was written up in a number of articles as the mature Manchurian candidate in this issue. That in Hanoi, he saw McCain turn red in the face. He even used the term rumble stilkskin, jumping up and down in place in a rage. If you release any of these records that you have here in Hanoi on me or the other POWs, you will never get diplomatic recognition. McCain may have been a, an expert on being a prisoner of war, but he was by no means an expert on the POW issue. John McCain uh, uh, and John Kerry both were um, not pursuing this at the, with the same uh, approach that I was. He insisted that no committee be set up unless he was chairman. Obviously, his intent was to kill everything. Okay, uh, I appreciate you inviting me here, but what I don't understand is this, you're supposed to have a committee of 12. <laughs> All my congressmen from Connecticut walked out. Uh, all the senators, uh, senators were on that panel. They all walked away. McCain took off. Kerry took off. All that evidence was coming out in Korea because they knew that if they came and listened to the truth, they'd have to keep the hearings open. They didn't want any information. So they weren't interested in doing anything with the information other than trying to discredit it. North Korea did not return a large number of American servicemen at the end of the war, and that some of the men left behind were sent to communist China and to the Soviet Union. Internal documents and statements made at the time also show that our government believed that men were still alive in captivity, and until only a few months ago has kept that reality from the American people. It has covered up what it knew through a pattern of denial, misleading statements, in some cases lies, and by doing so with regard to the Korean conflict, it broke its commitment with the people who put on the uniform to fight for the freedoms and protection that we and our allies enjoy today. What I found interesting was that coincidental to Kerry running the committee, Vietnam gave to Kerry's family sole rights for the negotiation of all real estate issues within, within Vietnam.
an agreement between the opposing forces, the Allied troops maintain a constant alert on the ground, in the air, and at sea. The constant shelling is concentrated on communist forces entrenched in hillside foxholes. The desired result is soon effected. Driven out, red prisoners of war display safe conduct flags as the shooting war goes on. The flag of captured grows. More of the enemy surrender each day, swelling the total of those who may be exchanged for United Nations troops now in enemy prison camps. Not all are taken alive. Wounded prisoners en route to hospitals received merciful treatment from UN captors. Their power to kill and maim spiked, communist weapons are added to the enormous total already in allied hands. Also testifying before the Senate Select Committee was retired Army Colonel Philip Corso, a former member of the National Security Council who served as President Eisenhower's POW MIA liaison. Colonel Corso verified that thousands of American POWs were abandoned in North Korea. Uh, do you have any comments on what you heard, especially relating to the numbers left behind and unaccounted for? I have no quarrel with that 8,000. No, that's, that was our estimate that we made over there at the time, that they were never returned, so they were left behind. Colonel Corso then dropped a bomb that stunned and angered Senate committee members when he admitted that President Eisenhower approved the recommendation to leave the POWs behind. I want to get this record straight on exactly what happened. Okay. Because there's a lot of speculation on what happened there and a lot of people are commenting on, but there was only three of us present. Unfortunately, the president died. C.D. Jackson, my superior, passed away. I was the only one left that was actually there. I know what happened, and I will tell you what happened without any speculation. The president was in the Oval Office, the three of us, and I saw him in he said, I understand you have a report on prisoners of war going to the Soviet Union. I told him, yes, that's what I'm here for. So I compiled this report, not only here, but information in Korea, which I said before, that close to 1,200 that we suspect, but about 900 certain that did go there. Our information is, is solid. He made a very direct statement, twice under oath. You know, Eisenhower made the decision. He was told specifically, these men were abandoned. We knew they'd been moved over there. And yes, it'll be very difficult to get them back. That was the recommendation that he accepted and said not to tell the families at the time. For me to assume that he would say to, to 1,200 families, I'm sorry, but we're not going to tell you anything about the fact that your loved ones may be alive, strains my imagination, and I appreciate yeah, your Well, testimony. sir, it, it possibly does, but... There was against the policy. The policy is thou shalt not confront the communists. That was White House policy. That was national policy. And that was the policy that Corso explained very clearly in his testimony. He said, you know, the current policy prevented you from saying anything strident about the Soviets. Uh, you couldn't demand anybody back. You couldn't go public. You couldn't do anything. U.S. policy forbid it. U.S. policy tied our hands. Which we was? Couldn't. U.S. policy was? policy was the Soviet Union, North Koreans, and the Chinese are not co-conspirators, and we will not make strident statements to antagonize them. But the big policy was the policy of fear, fear of general war. That was the policy that was stopping us. Our policy was fear of general war. Fear of general war. And, sir, I have the policy numbers there in my statement. Uh, Colonel Joe Schlater, November 9, 1989. There is no evidence to suggest that any U.S. personnel were not released from captivity in Korea. Now, that's just, I mean, I, I just don't understand people in responsible positions coming up here to the Hill and saying that, that kind of thing. And I, I, I don't want to dispute it because I've been through that for eight years with you people. I don't have desire to dispute it. As I said in my opening statement, the facts speak for themselves. The evidence speak for themselves. And it's itself, and it's time for you people to come up here and accept that evidence and begin to move to the next step, which is to find out what happened to these people and where they are. That's what we've got to start doing. So why don't you just admit that you've got the evidence? 
I know for a fact that uh, from my perspective, the job was not done. We didn't finish the investigation. Corso was one that should have been pursued more and uh, we, didn't, we didn't get it done. It was a good old boys system that did what they needed to do. They cleared the decks, they moved on. And I'm sure that, that they still continued to do each other favors, except for Smith who's now out. on the Korean front sound the keynote and echo the stalemate around the world in 1951. More than a million red casualties and 100,000 allied marked the second year of conflict which saw General MacArthur relieved of his post as Commander-in-Chief of the Far East, raising a storm of controversy over the nation. He was succeeded by General Matthew B. Ridgway, who undertook the difficult task of facing the hordes of Chinese reds. America was stunned by reports of the mass murders of 5,500 of their own war prisoners slaughtered in cold blood behind communist lines. Stalemate was again the word for truce negotiations after more than 150 sessions between United Nations top-level officers and their red opposite numbers. The only conclusion reached definitely in the tent at Panmunjom with the communist representatives was the establishment of a buffer zone two and one half miles wide extending along the present battle zone above the 38th parallel. It was the entering wedge in the deadlock which has marked the Korean struggle since the United Nations undertook its police action in the Far East. He's the only person, to my knowledge, in Congress who has been steadfast in trying to resolve this issue and find out what's happened. Korea was the simplest. 389 Category 1 live, healthy American prisoners left behind in July and August of 1953. And every time I went through Korea, I would not show off, but educate all the congressmen on a delegation, a CODEL. I would say, first of all, before we start the briefing, let me jog my memory. 389 Category 1 prisoners, are they still carried as MIA from the Korean War? And they'd say, oh, yes, sir, you have a good memory, 389, yes, sir. And Congressman would go, what? Most of them hadn't even been in the military. 389 healthy Americans left behind. So Korea always should have let off any hearing. Although Colonel Corso's testimony before the Senate Select Committee did not register with the media, his appearance before the Dornan Committee topped that evening's TV network news. In Dornan's hearings, he could not be dismissed as an elderly man whose memory was not working all that well. Uh, in Dornan's hearings, they had obtained documentation out of the Eisenhower Library that Congressman Dornan actually read through during the hearings, which supported almost verbatim precisely what Colonel Corso was testifying. Even after a little big switch ended and the information was back here on 8,000 prisoners were not returned, and we had information too there at the time, which I don't think has, has been very rarely brought out, that some of these prisoners, even the sick and wounded, and some and then later on big switch, were actually brought to Kaesong in the outskirts, but were never handed over to us. And if we can't tell the families, if we tell the families and we can't get them out, and that makes the news, we're in trouble here. We got a problem. And the president said, well, what do you, what do you suggest? I suggest we declare them all missing, presumed dead, which they did. In 1968, Czechoslovakian general Jan Shana requested political asylum in the United States and became the highest ranking communist defector to the West. Contained in his memory was a treasure trove of information about abandoned U.S. soldiers transferred to the Soviet Union. But he knew where the bodies were buried. And the people that are over there now, most of them don't still know because, you know, they didn't get into that detail and they didn't have the memories like he had. And he knew where things were and had identified people 
who would corroborate what he, with what he said, had identified documents, had identified photographs of American POWs taken in Czechoslovakia. And the last thing in the world anybody wanted was to have that information surface. They were not happy with him being there. That was the only witness that they were really, that I know of, that they were really very quite upset about, worried a little bit about what he might say. Over his time, he had been called to testify uh, six times, and each time, just before he was supposed scheduled to appear, uh, the testimony had been shut down and canceled by people in the administration. He was committed to testifying, and uh, what I did that morning was I kind of uh, kept him sequestered. I hid him in our office, and um, when people came around looking for him or they were, you know, asking questions, I just, you know, didn't comply and felt that it was important that he not be tampered with as a witness. He was threatened three times. I think the testimony was on Tuesday, as I recall. He was threatened on, on Thursday and then over the weekend and in terms of a written note, and then he was test threatened again in a phone call the morning of the testimony. And the essence of it was, if you testify, we'll kill you. He was dead a year later. But there, were, there was pressure on all of us. And I have to say that the pressure was partly something that when we dealt with a very obstinate bureaucracy that fiercely defended itself. because America never leaves a man behind. That is poison to us who know this issue because it just isn't true. My understanding is that U.S. policy says that none were left behind. And they've said that with respect to World War II, with respect to Korea, and with respect to Vietnam. And since none were left behind, none are there. And that is the official policy. And the corollary there is we won't find any alive, so you don't bother looking, really. And now I think the current question is, and the question that remains to this day and implicates the people that are running the government today, is why do we persist in keeping that a secret? You know, what's wrong with saying, okay, we really screwed up? Because you already know it anyway, so all we're doing is legitimizing it. They've lied about everything since 1953. What difference does it make? What happens is, for one reason or another, they realize it wasn't the best decision, and rather than admit that they made a mistake, which would then create the transparency in government that is necessary, they try to hide it. And then by hiding it, they compound the problem, because in order to hide it, they have to lie some more, and it just becomes one snowball of lying. It exposes the fact that we've covered it all up. It exposes the, the equally bad crime of our political leaders in looking the other way when they abandoned these men, knowing precisely what was going to be happening to them. As Phil Chenery says in his book, Korean Atrocities, that was the greatest atrocity of all. Now, suppose this had gotten out to the American people. There'd have been such a hue and cry about that. Why did we leave our sons over there to go through that hell for the rest of their life? You know, that would be devastating to people. We would have to rewrite history. I think it's safer for the American government to find remains of POWs because the remains cannot talk or show anger. Remains are important. I'm not discrediting that. But I feel that we should be also 
or primarily asking about live Americans in North Korea? No, actually the, the pursuit of live Americans is our number one priority uh, ahead of that of pursuing the recovery of remains. Several reasons, of course, there may be lives at stake. They have never admitted that there are live Americans in North Korea. We need to be careful that uh, what some people might call a prisoner of war, other people would call uh, defectors. They always say that, yes, those are the men that defected. Obviously, the United States government's policy is to bring Americans home, to account for them if they're POWs. Bloodstained years end as the last round is fired in Korea. Under terms of the truce, work proceeds rapidly on the dismantling of fortifications and the removal of all weapons from the demilitarized zone. But though the guns are stilled, there are grisly reminders of the struggle. The inevitable wreckage of war strews the battered landscape as the welcome work of truce goes forward. For the first time, UN soldiers can relax in clear sight of the enemy who is doing a little relaxing himself. The quiet is music to their ears and even a commie knows good trumpet playing when he hears it. Maybe this is the red strut. All along the 125 mile front, faces are wreathed in smiles. The long days and weeks of tension are passed as unit after unit moves to rear areas. This is a time when packs and equipment are lighter by pounds. The long struggle ended when UN officers entered the now historic truce building at Pon Moon Jum, where red opposite numbers prepare to sign the truce terms, which were almost two years in the making. With final details ironed out, the documents are handed to UN negotiators for signature. 30 copies of each document are signed and exchanged. With the fighting over, the first and most pressing step is the exchange of prisoners, and an LST debarks a contingent of fanatic Chinese captives who, in a last defiant gesture, rip their uniforms to shreds. They're followed by North Korean Reds, smartly dressed and well-drilled, who march snappily to the train which will take them to the exchange point. Under terms of the truce agreement, all prisoners must be exchanged within 90 days after the signing. After running its grim course, the Korean War grinds to a halt. Pentagon analyst In Sung Lee distributed an internal report in 1996 documenting credible intelligence reports and his personal interviews with eyewitnesses of live American POWs in North Korea. In Sung Lee's efforts were far more impressive and meaningful in terms of, you know, there are between 10 and 16 or whatever it is, people that he believes are there, possibly as many as 100 and maybe it's because of the tremendous credibility of his efforts getting over there, talking to people, reading, speaking the language, is why he's possibly been reassigned out of the POW MIA area. Uh, yes, I remember when, uh, when that report was issued and uh, some people seized on it as uh, the absolute perfect answer to a lot of questions, but in actuality it was one analyst's view of, uh, of an issue doesn't always match what another analyst's view would be. The, the thing that so impressed me about him was that he was great for us, and the press were learning things, the families were happy, but the attitude across the Potomac and the Pentagon was, why is he doing this to us? You know, like, why is he doing this credible investigative work and building this case study? Uh, this is hurting us. Kind of like that congressman that leaned over, you're starting to hurt me now, Bob. You're making me look bad. He's making us look bad. In his report, In Sung Lee states, there are too many live sighting reports of Americans in North Korea to dismiss that there are no American POWs still being held against their will. All of the reports, all of the investigations, everything that we have had as a result of our efforts in North Korea have not indicated that there are in fact live Americans currently being held against their will in North Korea. The negative reaction to his report forced In Sung Lee to leave the Pentagon POW MIA office.
He is now Chief of Operations at Homeland Security. Today, In Sung Lee continues to stand by his Pentagon report of live American POWs in North Korea. In 1997, when my family was involved in rescuing my uncle and his family from North Korea, at that time we had heard from our guides who, were, um, who had access into North Korea that they had heard that there are POWs still living in North Korea. However, they, they said that they wouldn't be situated, located near Pyongyang, the capital. Um, they're in... They're in kind of like rural farm, farming areas in the more poverty-stricken areas. A former Romanian engineer now living in Connecticut read in the Hartford Current about Bob's search for his brother and called the newspaper to report seeing American POWs while on a sightseeing tour in North Korea. All Romania in the bus uh, so the around 50 uh, people with faces, the uh, Caucasian faces. Bob arranged for Sirban Oprika to testify before the U.S. Senate Select Committee on POW MIAs. The night before Oprika testified, he was held under hostile interrogation by FBI agents until his appearance before the committee. I was at the carry, I was almost black out. I didn't know what to talk and what to speak. With Caucasian face, and behind them, I saw more people working in the, the camp. What were, how were they dressed and were they guarded? Was, uh, they was dressed with the North Korean dress, uh, like, like their uh, POW. American POW. You, you were told these other folks were American POWs that you saw alive. Yes. In the past several years, many North Korean defectors have reported the existence of American POWs in the DPRK. In 2003, North Korean defector Kim Yong, a former lieutenant colonel in the North Korean Intelligence Service, arrived in the United States with information about American POWs in North Korean labor camps. He said that President Kim Il-sung put them in the camp and forced them to work to make them see how quickly the land of North Korea, which they had tried to occupy, would be developed. The former North Korean army general told Kim that there were many other American and British POWs in the labor camps. Every defector, every escapee who comes out of the North to date, none of them have provided any creditable evidence uh, to substantiate live Americans being held against their will in North Korea. I can tell you that I'm 99.9% certain that there were live Americans in North Korea when I was there. Um, this is a tape, okay, about the U.S. government turning down, okay, the opportunity, okay, to rescue seven live Americans. And they negotiated for several months between South Korea, North Korea, and the White House. And they were meeting back and forth in his restaurant, not at the White House, but in his restaurant. So on the last day that they would negotiate for the prisoners, he called uh, Colonel Pritchard. Jack Pritchard okay, in the White House, and President Clinton, their boss, did not want to negotiate for POWs with the North Koreans when the North Koreans were highly motivated, okay, to give us those men back. But immediately, uh, the State Department and the executive branch came out with the information that uh, this offer of live Americans was not a credible offer because it didn't come through, quote, the normal channels. Many, many communiques, many deals, many treaties did not start through normal 
diplomatic channels. If I were president and somebody told me they had six Americans or seven Americans, I'd talk with them. Yeah. No, I'm telling them the thing well. to do is just to let's hash it out. I said, we'll get the POWs on the table and you'll be able to negotiate for them. I said, but I, you know, my government's not open to it yet. Yeah. No, yeah, it was certainly not. About two months later, I get a call back and Jack Pritchard is now ambassador to North Korea. Don't tell me how we can have an ambassador to North Korea when we don't have an embassy in North Korea. But anyway, he's back there. They never go away. The bad guys never go away. Operation Big Switch swings into high as each day is a receiving center at Panmunjom. Despite their harrowing ordeal, some summon the strength to wave as Freedom nears and Alliance officers await them. Some leap from the trucks at the sight of Freedom Gate, but there are others not so fortunate, those who bear the testimonial of wounds and neglect in the red prison camps. Others are completely dazed and are restrained from jumping blindly, unable to comprehend it all. South Koreans, most of whom were brutally maltreated by their captors, are delirious with joy as they reach the haven of Freedom Village. It is a poignant scene with peaks of happiness, followed swiftly by those bearing the indelible marks of their recent nightmare. Men who have lost limbs through barbarous neglect in the bitter cold of the Manchurian winters. Rugged Turkish soldiers whose faces mirror the horror of their treatment at the hands of the Reds. The most seriously disabled are rushed to the helicopter landing area for transfer to base hospitals. We go to North Korea and we go, you don't have POWs, do you? Well, you're giving them the message. You don't have POWs. I think we also owe it to the active duty service personnel who run the armed forces now that we not put them into a situation where countries know that if they are snatched, that they will in fact be used uh, and bartered for uh, by the United States in our foreign relations. Uh, we have seen this and we've had a standing uh, uh, policy over the years not to negotiate uh, in that regard. How anybody can be asked to put the uniform on today and be told that you're going to be left on a battlefield somewhere, dead or alive, it's just not right. In recent years, several South Korean POWs captured during the Korean War have escaped from North Korea. And I think you have the same potential uh, respecting Americans that would be present up there. And that one way or another, something could work to free them. Well, the only thing working against any of these men being alive today is the passage of time. But it would take a, one of two things, it seems, would have to happen. Either it would have to require a private initiative which was orchestrated without anybody in the government ever knowing about it. Or else it would have to have been done with the, uh, the assistance of North Korean officials who wanted to embarrass the government for one reason or another. Uh, there's, no, there's no passion now for it. There's no passion in, gover in government for it. And um, we can't, if we really believe that we leave no soldier behind, then we should have that passion and uh, particularly in the military, and they should be, and we all should be, and the public should be pushing and demanding that they get the answers. If we don't do something now, if we don't get the government to make this the highest national priority, in the POW issue, people that work the POW issue and the families, when they say that phrase, they laugh. It is a joke. It is a phrase used by politicians on Memorial Day and Veterans Day and they give it no meaning because they put no force behind it. It takes long enough, nobody will be alive to answer the question anyway. Nobody will come home, everybody associated with Korea will be dead, and there won't be any answers. That's what the CIA agent told me one time here at my house, right here, right in this room. 
when they're all dead, there won't be no answers. soil, never could there be so welcome a sight as the faces of those who greeted the first 29 returned prisoners of war at Travis Air Force Base, California. Some couldn't walk off the huge stratofreighter, but their stretchers had a new sense of security as they were whisked to waiting ambulances in friendly hands among friendly faces, and above all, the feel of American soil beneath them. Yes, they had come home, and it had been a long way and they brought with them the cruel brands of war and imprisonment. Even as they arrived in San Francisco, arrangements were underway to take them to their hometowns. In New York, the arrival of a transport plane in one of the world's busiest airports brings out the press in force, as Juan Osario Melendez of Puerto Rico is first of the repatriated prisoners to reach New York, and the welcoming arms of his mother, his wife, and the welcome sight of the baby he'd never seen. This was reunion in New York for one who had lived many more than his 22 years. It's a heart ripper. Is there a chance that a boy who was in combat at 17 years of age and was a POW through his late teen years, 18, 19, 20, and was healthy and helped other people survive and was on a truck heading for freedom a month after the Eisenhower forced ceasefire. Witnesses saw guards come up and order Roger Dumas and a few others off the truck and march him back into the uh, compound area, never to be heard from again. I used to dream of uh, waking up one morning and, and, and picking up Time magazine with a, and on the front page is a POW from Korea alive and coming home. I mean, it was just, uh, and just think, you know, how, how, what a tremendous story that would be. Same picture you're looking at here when he was 17. He's now 61, but he's still young enough to play ball, like me. So I'm hoping that I get the invitation that we've asked for to bring him home myself. I'm not waiting any longer after 42 years. I will bring him home. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this medal on him when I get there. Because this belongs to him, not me. Thank you very much.